So if you have it in you to stand up one more time, <laughs> let's just read a short verse, Romans 8, 1. I like to lift the word above my head. It's a good habit to remind myself. His ways are high above my ways. Amen. So this is a short verse, Romans 8, 1. Ready? Can you read it? And then we'll pray. It says, those who enter into Christ's life no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying background because a new power is in operation. Say it one more time. A new power is in operation. So, Lord, we thank you that this is true because it's your word and that we live in that new power right now. Our lives are filled with that new power that's in operation. We don't have to live under that low-hanging black cloud any longer because you have blown that thing away with the breath of your spirit, which now resides in us. I pray each one of us that's here today and anybody listening would have a fresh baptism of your anointing and of your Holy Spirit. We want more. Say it with me, would you? We want more of your presence in our lives. We want more hunger for your presence in our lives that we would not be satisfied, Lord, with status quo, but that you would take us up another level in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so get your fork and knife out because we're going to have a meal. It's good to feed on the Word. That's what the Bible tells us. Eat this book, right? So don't just read it, but study it to show yourself approved. Um, it's been a real blessing, like I said, just for the last roughly, I guess, 18 months since I moved to get back to my first love, to just have more time to get back to my first love because that commute was just sucking up. It's not just time, but energy. After commuting all week, I didn't have much left on a Saturday even. But now my life is way back in balance. I can go to the gym right up the block to the YMCA. So just so many things are hitting on, on more cylinders. And I really can relate to what he's saying here because this is the expanded part right after what we read as the text verse. It says, a new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air. And couldn't you relate to what Catherine was saying, that that's what happened in her family? It's like a strong wind comes in and blows out 12 years of hard feelings between her father and, and, and her brother. And all of a sudden, the Lord says, know what? This is not okay. What's going on here? The devil's happy about this, but the Lord wants to be happy. And he's happy when people can sit together at a wedding and that Catherine could perform the wedding because she got the uh, chaplain training when, when she was here. And our lives are just transformed by his power. And, and, you know, what did it say right before that? We enter into the life of Christ. We don't have to live under this low-hanging low or low-lying black cloud. And that's what that life without the Lord was like. And, and the people that don't know him are still living under that low-hanging black cloud. Hopefully when we come in and we interact with them, that we're like that breath of fresh air, which Catherine was to her family. So it goes on to say, not only did the Lord come in like a strong wind and magnificently clear the air, what did he do? He freed me from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. <laughs> That's not an exaggeration. I've said it before, but it, it's, it bears repeating. There's more people dying of suicide now than ever in our country, even though our economy is prospering and the unemployment rate is very low. There's more people addicted to opioids than ever before in our culture. Why? Why would that be? Why would people be taking their lives in the midst of prosperity because of this problem? There's a brutal tyranny that the devil holds over people. If you don't know the Lord, you're, you're caught under this brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. They keep trying to solve the problem on their own, right? The world tries to come up with these solutions, but they're hollow and empty because it doesn't have the power of the Word of God behind it. And they want to take certain things out of here. Like if you ask somebody who the Good Samaritan is, even if they're not Christians, they know the principle, right? Someone who helps somebody along the way. If you ask people what the golden rule is, they know it's do unto others the way you'd want it done unto yourself. They don't know that's a quote from Matthew chapter 7. That's built right into Christian you know, theology is, is the Sermon on the Mount. But they don't want the part about you have to have control over your appetites. They want to be able to say, no, I could sleep with whoever I want whenever I want. And the Lord said, no, I got a better plan for you. That's a really bad idea. Your flesh wants you to do that, but I've giving you a better set of rules here. Now, without the Holy Spirit, the law kills, the Bible says, right? 
But we live in this dispensation where we have Holy Spirit and the law. So the law is not bad, but what it did was expose what sin looks like. And it's a little confusing when you read some parts of this book, actually, the book of Romans, where we hear about the law, and it sounds like Paul is almost saying that the law is, is not any use anymore, and that's not what he's saying. I'm going to get to that. I just want you to think about our culture and how much God loves the lost, and we have the key. We know the answer, and we can preach messages, but they're watching our lives, and if our lives are modeling what they know they need, they're going to want to come to us. And that's what the Bible says, to provoke people to jealousy as they look at your life. They're going to want what you have. Amen? And then it says, Jesus entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. If that doesn't just nail it, I don't know what does. And I don't like to make political commentary about our country. It's really hard to make blanket statements about America. But we can't help but, but look at the, the news and and the media, and, and it's really, there's, there's open signs of hostility in the culture right now, right? And now, we have to be honest and admit that women have been really badly treated for a really long time by men in power. Men in power have abused the authority they've been given, and they have taken advantage of women. Some of those women did it voluntarily, knowing what the calculation was gonna be, but there were plenty that didn't do it voluntarily and did not feel that they had a voice and that they could say anything. That's wrong. God hates that, okay? He hates injustice. What's the answer? The heart of man is evil. The Bible tells us if they don't get saved, these men are gonna keep doing it. It's not the culture. It's not passing a law that's gonna change the heart of man. It might make it harder to do it, but like they don't have a solution. They don't have an answer. So they come up with things that they think are gonna be an answer. So I'm only giving you one example because it kind of points to how f the futility of some of the solutions man comes up with to try to uh, put boundaries around the heart of people, okay? So what this is is a, a headline in the news that said Netflix passed a rule that said men and women cannot maintain eye contact for more than five seconds on the job. Okay? Got it? So you're supposed to be that aware that if you're having a conversation with your boss over a really important business matter, that if I'm talking to you, not only do I have to think about what I'm saying, if I keep eye contact for more than five seconds, I have to look away. I don't know how long I'm supposed to stay looking away, but I guess at some point I can come back and look at you again. I know, I mean, we can laugh, but they just don't have a better answer. Do you think this is gonna solve the problem? Why, it's not getting to the root. The root is in the heart. The heart has to be transferred over into the kingdom. You have to be transferred out of darkness and into light. Because five seconds means nothing. Okay, you get it? And, and that's what I, I'm hoping we gain a little empathy for the lost people, because this, this is the best solution? Five seconds? Like, how did this ever make it to the press? Like, somebody didn't think that's a ridiculous idea. It's unenforceable. Nobody could ever do that, but that's the best they could come up with because hearts are, are what I said in that verse before. Jesus comes in and enters this disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. That's the new power that's in operation. How we do it is not so easy, right? Like each one of us here, if, you know, if there was some miraculous way to be graded on everything that happened to you in the last week, how many would get an A plus on everything that you did? Okay, you're, you're honest, Victor. <laughs> but how many would get an F on everything you did? You could be honest, no, you know, we did some things right and some things when you look back, you could say, well, I could have handled that differently. What's the difference maker? how alert I am to the presence of God in my life and whether I'm submitting myself to his lead or if I want to take things into my own hands, right? So that's why I keep doing this on Sunday mornings. Your ways are high above my ways, Lord. I have to be reminded often that it's not might or power, it's your spirit that gives us the victory. But look, we're, we're kind of raised in such a way that we're taught to be independent. And that is not what the Lord says 
He says you're to be interdependent. Pray without ceasing. Always ask him, how should I handle this situation? Whatever you're going into. You with me? Okay. So here's an example in Acts uh, chapter 8 of these new Christians in Samaria. Uh, Philip had gone there after Stephen was murdered, the first martyr. Remember Stephen in chapter 7 was martyred. And now all of a sudden the church is uh, kind of splintering. And Philip, who was one of the seven, I guess some people call it deacons, uh, that were named in the book of Acts, is a man of God. He's not one of the apostles, but he's a powerful man. And he goes to an area like almost like you would say New York City, right, where Christianity is not exactly welcomed. It, there's a hostile reaction often, not always, but often, to you talking about your faith. Uh, so Philip goes in there, and all of a sudden, signs and wonders and miracles just start happening, and people get saved. How many would like that today? Yes. Why not today? I mean, we're the same people. God's no respect of persons. If he did it through Philip, he could do it through us. But if we're not expecting it to happen, you know, if somebody tells you they're sick and the first thing you say is, oh, I, I took really good medicine. Like, you're, you're, like you just like cut God right out of the formula. Like, how about, can I pray for you? Right. Oh, but what if it doesn't work? Who's telling you that? Right. The devil, right? It's not God saying that. He wants us to pray, call for the elders, anoint oil, anoint them with oil. <coughs> Excuse me, Elijah was a man just like we are, it says. <coughs> Excuse me in the book of James. And he prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't, didn't rain for over three years. A man just like we are. So he wasn't more special than us. He just had faith. So that's what God wants us to have. And this says, um, you know, basically the, the lead up to this is Jerusalem heard about what was going on in Samaria. And frankly, the implication is, really? In Samaria? Like as bad as that place is? There's a revival going on? You two guys go down there and check that out. And, and Peter and John go down there to check it out. And they pray for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And it says in 16, for as yet, these new Christians in Samaria, the Spirit had uh, fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in what? The name of the Lord, Jesus, right? So they were Christians. They were baptized, but they hadn't been filled with the Spirit yet. Then Peter and John laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And then there was a man there named Simon the Sorcerer who was watching. And he saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, and he offered them money, <laughs> saying, give me this power also. Now, are we going to condemn him for that? No. He didn't know any better. He saw a demonstration of power, right? But what do we say that the theme for today is? A new power is in operation, right? He was tapped in to a dark power. And look, here we are coming up with Halloween this week, right? It's a celebration of dark power. I don't want to be part of that. You can decide how you want to handle it, but I'm not going to honor one of de the devil's holidays, <laughs> okay? Your call, but it seems pretty obvious to me that we don't want to participate in that. That's why we're offering you an alternative to come here with your kids and, and have fun with them. So it says he asked for this power also. What, what wouldn't be obvious from what I just said, though, is the verses right prior to that, in, in verse 10, they were talking about this man, Simon, and they said, this man is the greatest wizard of all. That's what the Samaritans were saying about this guy. The divine power of God walks among us. Everyone was in awe of him because of his astonishing displays of the magic arts. But as Philip preached, many believed his message and were baptized, both men and women, even Simon, it says, was baptized. That means he got saved. But just because he was saved didn't mean he was fully sanctified. He still was carrying some of that old baggage with him from the days, look at what they call them, the, the greatest wizard of all. Well, can the greatest wizard get saved? Say yes. Why not? God loves that. Paul was a murderer. Wrote a big chunk of the New Testament. So nobody is beyond hope. But the church is supposed to stand in the middle of God and the world's pain, bring the truth in an empathetic way, not saying that what they're doing is okay, but saying you're okay. God still loves you. They already know they're messed up. So if we're coming through as Judge Judy, <laughs> not good. They don't want to be judged. They already know they're sinning. By the way, are we still sinning too? What's the difference? We're trying not to, <laughs> hopefully. 
They're not, because they don't even know that concept, right? For people who aren't born, born again, it's whatever, the, you just make up your own rules, and whatever I feel is, is the rule in the moment. And we're saying, no, no, there's such a better way. It's not a crutch. It's scaffolding for your life. It'll put structure around you. It'll give you knowledge that you never would have arrived at on your own. Because he loves you, he wants to show you how to live. But as I said earlier, this without the Holy Spirit is death. I'm quoting scripture. So too much rules and no oil, you grind to a halt. And you don't just die, you kill other people with legalism. So they had to be careful with this man because he said, how do I pay for this power? I want you to, I want to pay you so when I lay hands on people, they'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, I perceive your heart ain't right yet. <laughs> See, he didn't throw him out. The guy had accepted the Lord, but his motives just weren't right yet. And I think if we could just maintain that posture when we're talking to other people and not expect them to go from unsaved, heathen, pagan person to knowing every book in the Bible and knowing how to apply every book, people have to grow in the Lord. And we have to have grace and patience for them. There's a new power and operation of the Holy Spirit, but we don't just integrate it perfectly the day we get saved, right? There's things that need to be sanctified. There's a process of holiness that we go through, and that's what this man Simon had to go through. We don't really read much about him after that, but it was so, a dramatic sign to these people that this man who was demonstrating evil power was now walking under the power of Christ. And, and his spirit. So nobody's too far gone. That's what the Lord wants us to remember. Uh, the brother that we heard about, 12 years, couldn't talk to his father. Not too far gone. The father who's sitting on bitterness and throws the letter on the table with anger. We could all relate, can't we? Been in those situations? Maybe been the person throwing the letter? Siri's asking me what I'm saying here. God help me. I think Siri needs healing. <laughs> so could you say that again? I didn't catch it the first time. <laughs> Sanctification. Look it up. <laughs> this is what it does. And why being in a body of believers is so important. Why having people pray with you and for you that you can trust is so important. Because you're bound to hit snags. You're bound to, to bump up against things that you just, you don't know the next thing to do. And God can use your brothers and sisters in Christ to help you move through it. So I, I just want to use this example that Paul uses in the chapter before. So we, we're in Romans 8 for our theme. There's a new power in operation. But in Romans 7, he unpacks some things that are related to that. And he uses this example. I'm using the New Living Translation now. It says, when a woman marries... The law binds her to her husband as long as he alive, as he's alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. That seems easy enough, right? Married, and the law sits in the middle between me and my wife. And the law that God gave us about marriage binds us together. Am I allowed to marry another person and have two wives? There'd be two dead people if that happened in my marriage, by the way. <laughs> And it wouldn't be Trish, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you could do the math. <laughs> so that's a rule. God has boundaries around your behavior. Well, I'm not marrying another woman. I just want to have sex with them. No, nope. two more dead people. Not happening. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just figuratively speaking, not actual. So there's rules. See, the law binds us together, and it gives us scaffolding. You know what scaffolding is, right? It's the structure you see on the outside of a building. That's like a frame. It's like a skeleton. How many are glad he gave us rules to live by? None of us would have came up with the same set of rules as what's in here. We would all have our own crazy version of it that don't work. And this one works. But you have to work it. <laughs> so that's not such a hard analogy. When a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he's alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply. So that, let's say that was the husband and, and the wife is here. So now the laws of marriage don't apply because I'm not married anymore. So I'm free to go marry another person, is what Paul is saying. That's nothing real complicated yet, is it? 
While her husband's alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law. Now, again, nothing too complicated about what we said so far. Here's been the problem, though. People have translated this verse to think this law died. They made the husband the law. It's not what Paul said. He said it's the thing that sits in the middle between the husband and wife that binds it together. And I could tell you're wondering where I'm going with this. I'll get there. So here's the way I wrote it. Marriage represents me being bound to my spouse by the law, right? Some thought that the law died once Christ resurrected, allowing us now to say we don't need that anymore. Flush the Ten Commandments. We're in the new dispensation. No, it's not what he ever meant. Now, there are things we don't have to follow, the traditions that we don't have to follow anymore. Paul said it right in the New Testament. All foods have now been made clean. So you don't have to, yes, amen, hallelujah. You can eat bacon. <laughs> that should really get a rise. <laughs> Whether you should or not is another story, but it's legal. <laughs> All things, you know, within measure. So look, here's what it meant. We died not the law, we died. So now we don't have to be married to that old fleshly life anymore. We could be married to, to the risen Christ. And there's a new power in operation when we're married to the risen Christ. We're not being driven by those old impulses anymore. You know, like you really don't have the supernatural power of God when you're not saved to control your appetites. Some Christians are still working on it, but at least we have the power in us because that's one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? Or a fruit, I shouldn't say fruits, a fruit of the Spirit is self-control. It's called temperance in the King James Bible. So it's there, but I might not have gotten victory over overeating. Let's just say that's one of them, right? I have to control my appetite about overeating. I have to control my sexual appetite. Well, before I was saved, I didn't have that power, but now a new power is working inside of me, Holy Spirit. I still have to submit to that power, but I have it in me to stop me from committing that sin of adultery or even the sin of porno watching pornography, right? I didn't have that power before, but now that, that old binding to that old marriage is gone, I'm married to Jesus, and he filled me with his spirit. So we're the bride. And he's the bridegroom, so we now have a whole new arsenal of weapons of Holy Ghost, but only gets tapped into if you bow your knee to his lordship. So you'll typically find the areas that you're struggling in that you still haven't fully surrendered that part of your heart to him. And part of that is that because part of your heart still doesn't fully believe that you can trust him in that area. And that's why in the class that we run, we call it counterfeit affections. Medicating pain, you've heard that expression too. That's a counterfeit affection. Have you ever looked into gambling, why people gamble? It's not so much about the money, it's about the adrenaline rush of what's going on during the bet, where you're in that excited period, and then it's either, oh, this big crash, or oh, I won. They're addict addicted to the adrenaline rush. It's not so much the money. So you get where I'm going here? It's like he changes the motive and the source of your life through the power of his Holy Spirit working in you. So is it any big surprise that Holy Spirit is a contentious issue among Christians? <laughs> it shouldn't be a surprise because there's a whole group of people that think it's not for today. And then there's a whole group of people that have, are, are kind of related to excesses of the Holy Spirit. In the early Pentecostal movement, you could say that with deliverance, Barf bags, you know, I don't want to go into all that detail, but like there was, a, there was a connection made by the traditional church about the early Pentecostals that it was all emotionalism and, you know, snake handlers and very little theology, very little in the way of academics and understanding the deeper things of theology. That's not true anymore, all right? Doesn't mean there weren't excesses because there's always going to be excesses whenever the human beings are involved. But people today have come to grips with the fact that, yes, he is for today, but he's the one in control, not us. And we don't manipulate his power. We submit to his power. And it's a beautiful thing. I quoted it from Cheon, right? He said, of the billion Christians today, 800 million of them are spirit-filled. That's all since 1906. 
So there's been a huge swing, and that's not his statistic, that's part of you know, his job is to run the Wagner Leadership Institute, which is now a university, and they study these things. Here, I don't mean to get off track too far here, it's just that you know, once you realize the power's there, even if it's not operating fully in your life, you know you have something to reach for. And you know, like back in the day, before the four minute mile was broken, you probably heard this analogy, a man named Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile, but it took, I don't remember how long people were trying and trying and trying and nobody could break it. Now all of a sudden he broke it, and within a couple of months, multiple other people broke it. Why? Because they knew it could be done. And when you know it can be done, that gives you that extra surge that you need to accomplish something. So when you can look at other Christians that are role models for you, right? We, um, it reminded me that when we were back at this um, funeral parlor yesterday, reminded me of Ann Matthews' funeral that we did at that same place just a few months ago. Every testimony was just in honor of this woman of God. She had such an impact on so many people, like one after another coming up, basically talking about the example that she set and the impact that she had on them. How great is that, right? People like that set a bar for us to say, you know what, I want to have that kind of impact. I don't want to just be sitting home watching TV every night. I want to be out doing what Jesus would want me to be doing. I want to impact the culture. I want to see lives changed. And we ran out of time today, but Lori has a testimony from being out witnessing to people. She's going to share that next week. So look, you know, we should all be thinking when we get together on Sunday, let's reflect back on the week and say, what were the great things that God did? And let's celebrate the great things that God did all week while we were doing it. This isn't a place to come like a hospital, like, oh, man, I'm limping in. They really treated me bad on my job this week. Pray I get another job. Swing low, sweet chariot. Come and take me home. <laughs> Can't take it here anymore. That's not a very warrior-like attitude, is it? We want to be taking the hill. Light belongs in the darkness, right? Okay, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> it's really not a very complicated message, but I really felt this is what the Lord was giving me to, for the meal today. He said, so, right after that, he says, so, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. Now, I'll admit that's a little hard to understand because it sounds like there's something in here that's wrong. He's not saying that. He said, once you got filled with the Spirit and you became a Christian now, you're in a phase two of the operation because the law by itself was there to show us that we couldn't follow it. Okay, it convicted us of sin, but it didn't give us the solution. Jesus is the solution. So we should be really happy that we're living in this new dispensation on this side of the cross and the resurrection, because it's not that this was bad, it was just partial. But it's not partial anymore, because we have spirit now to live by this book, amen? And, and we have the second half of the book. So if you really ask, what's the difference between Christianity and Judaism? is the Holy Spirit. It's a huge part of it. Is they don't have that hope of God's Spirit actually residing in us. They still have to go to the temple to be in God's presence. Well, he's inside of you. And look at the person next to you say, he's inside of you. Let him out. <laughs> I died to the power of law when I died with Christ. And you are now united with the one who was raised from the dead. That's good news. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. But that only happens if you start from a place of humility, right? You have to start each day saying, Lord, I don't know what your plan is for me today. I know what I'd like it to be, but really that matters little compared to what you want me to do today. And if the thing you want me to do today doesn't always look like it's going to generate much glory for me, no big deal. It's not about glory for me. It's that you get all the glory. And when that happens, then he knows he can trust you. And then all of a sudden, he starts putting new situations in front of you that he knows you're going to step into because you've proven your character to him. It's not works mentality, is it? It's not earning anything. It's just proving faithful. It's all throughout the Bible. Joseph, if you ever read, study his life, Potiphar was so impressed with this guy. He basically said, here's my checkbook. I trust you so much. You pay my bills. I know you're not going to steal from me because since you've been here, my house is totally in order. That's finding favor. 
That's God. I want to trust you. Prove yourself faithful in a little, you get rewarded with more. Biblical principle, right? All right, this says in Romans 7, 6, now that we've been fully released from the power of the law, we are dead to what once controlled us. So let's make it modern day. You're all Christians. Let's assume that we're all Christians here today, filled with the Spirit. And there's a certain area that tries to spring back up to life. And we know it's sinful. And sometimes if you had a, a, a pattern of behavior before you got saved, that echo of that thing tries to come back. It could have been gambling, like I said before. It could have been pornography. It could have been so many other things, drinking alcohol or whatever. And um, it tries to come back. But you're dead to it. We've been fully released from the power of the law. We are dead to what once controlled us. That's good news. You should smile at that. It has no control of me anymore unless I let it. And the only way that could happen is that I'm not fully submitted to God in that area because I might not believe that that's a big deal. Like, look, I, I could say, I don't say this, but if I, if I said, look, I'm a married man. What's the big deal about pornography? I'm not having sex outside of marriage because the Bible says it's a sin <laughs> just to look at it. It's not hard to understand why, is it? Because if that's what I'm feeding on all the time, that's what I'm going to want all the time. And if I'm looking at people who are getting paid to do this, you know, that's a pretty high standard to try to live up to. And none of us can live up to that, right? So now all of a sudden, my wife doesn't look as attractive as she used to, and it's a sin. It's evil. It's getting planted in my heart. But if I don't believe that it's wrong, then I can allow myself to do it. And now all of a sudden, the devil has an entry into my life. And then there's spiritual adultery before there's actual adultery. Because I opened the door by not believing what this said about it. So this didn't die but we now have this oil on the side of the cross that we're on to tell us how to apply it. Because if you apply this without oil, you'll kill people. They'll think you're judgmental. With the oil, we get the best combination. Why does God care that we don't sin? It's because he can't bless sin, right? You are blessed by obedience. So whether you understand it fully or not, if he says it in his word, believe it. Because it's true. And we can work on the understanding part. Like half the time people just get so caught up. Nah, that one I don't think I have. I don't think I believe that one. That's a problem, isn't it? Dig in a little deeper. Study it harder. Get some counsel. Get some advice. Because once we close the doors to the sin coming into our lives, we can flourish for the Lord. And you never want to go back to the counterfeit when you've had the real, when you've had the authentic, okay? It says our lives are no longer motiva motivated by the obsolete way of following the written code. Now, what would that be? What happened, and what still happens today among what we'd say legalistic people, not just religious Christians or any religion, you could have legalism on your job. And what happens is you start competing against people to outrank them. That's not God, right? So let's just say on the worship team here, we're praying, Lord, send us more musicians, send us more musicians. What if he sends us really good musicians and they're better than me? And I said, well, now I feel threatened, <laughs> right? You get how, yeah, you better be ready. If you're going to ask for it, you better be ready for him to answer. But if all my identification is in the worship leader, then that's wrong. That's not how God ever meant it. My value is not what I do. My value is who I am. I'm his son. Well, if I ask for more musicians and he sends them, praise God, I don't have to do it anymore. There's somebody better than me here. Hallelujah. There's something else he wants me to do. You know that's true. There's always going to be another thing, and it'll probably be a promotion. But if you were so stuck over here about your image, you were blocking yourself from the next step. So the thing that he sends you that you think is threatening could be the very way to your next thing that he wants you to do. See how this works? It's all about submission. It's just being humble. I'm not in charge. I want to, uh, John Wimber used to say, God, I'm just like a coin in your pocket. You can spend me any way you want. You want a Coke today? Spend me on a Coke. You want a bag of Fritos? <laughs> You're the boss. I want to listen to what you want to do for me, amen, through me. So that's, that's the, the obsolete way is to use this as a ranking system. 
because we're not competing against each other. We're co-laboring with Christ. And we want everybody to fully develop in the gift that they have. And if that means you're going to have to be shifted because of that, praise God. We care about winning the game, not my role in the game. All right. Okay, good. You're getting it. So now we can serve God by living in the freshness of a new life. How? In the power of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what we're doing. All right. Just a couple more to go. Sorry. Make sure I'm at the right one. Yeah, there we go. That's what baptism is. He says in Romans 6, 3 through 5. That's what baptism is into the life of Jesus. That's what it means. Sorry. When we are lowered into the water, it's like the burial of Jesus. And when we are raised up out of the water, it's like the resurrection of Jesus. So throughout our lives, even now as Christians, if there's a, if there's a besetting sin that's trying to hold us back, this is the picture. We have to kill it. It's got to die. We've got to put it to death and come back up, no longer desiring to watch pornography, no longer desiring to gamble the, the mortgage money away. There was some rogue thing that, that was loosed inside my spirit because I didn't fully believe it was wrong. So I opened the door and let it in. Now all of a sudden God is saying, We're not, your life's not over because of this, but you got to do something about it. Yes, you're a Christian. If you die, you go to heaven. But you're not fully hitting on all the cylinders because there's this open door to sin. And once you see it this way, it's like, oh, yeah, each of us is raised into a light-filled world by the Father. And if I'm still struggling with something, it's not too late to put it to death and be resurrected on the other side, not wanting to do that thing anymore. Man, I don't know about you, but that makes me very excited because I don't have to be bound by what Satan wants to use against me. It says it couldn't be any clearer that our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power. Okay? I didn't like myself, so I did drugs. Once I started liking myself and I knew God liked me, loved me, I didn't want to do the drugs anymore because I liked me. I, I was okay with me and I knew he was okay with me. And if other people weren't so okay with me, it didn't bother me as much because I knew he loved me. It doesn't mean I don't want to change, but now all of a sudden, no, I'm, that former identity is deprived of its power over me. I was co-crucified with him to dismantle the stronghold of sin that was inside me. I'm not saying any of you are in sin. I don't want this to be any kind of condemning message. What I'm, what I'm hoping is that if there is an open door somewhere, the Lord will reveal it to you. Because what would we all be hoping for is that each of us is bringing newly saved people to church every week because we met them at the mall on Tuesday after work and we witnessed to them and they got saved and they want to know, know, what has, know, know what they have to do. Be baptized, get a Bible, study, get plugged into a good church, right? That's the victory march. Come back in on Sunday. These are all the great things God did for me this week. God did through me this week. And, and it is happening. That does happen. But let's have it happen more. Let's expand the kingdom of God. Each one of us has it in us. And I'm telling you, most of the people that aren't saved that you talk to don't know what I just read that they can be crucified with Christ and be resurrected with him, and whatever the stronghold of sin that's in them can be dismantled and destroyed so that we would not continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. I, this, is the, this is the conflict that Paul described that some people might find a little confusing when you read the Bible. You know, you can think of it this way. He says, I'm so confused. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. What a conflict that's going on on the inside of me. Now, is he a Christian? Yes. yes. So it doesn't mean you're delivered from all this. The day you get saved, there's still a conflict going on. What it means, though, is there's a new power in operation. And you've got Holy Spirit inside to help you sort this out. But like you didn't have before. You know, so the, the guy on the job who's not Christian can't, Stop looking after five seconds. He doesn't have that power. I mean, it's a silly rule. We would all agree it's probably a silly rule. The intent behind the rule is not bad. It's the execution that wouldn't work. So look, we don't want that going on on the job. We don't want inappropriate behavior on the job. But the, the guy that doesn't have the tools that I'm talking about here can't stop himself. And the world basically taught him to live that way. So this is even harder for 
a non-Christian, the things I know I shouldn't do, I end up doing. The things I know I should do, I don't end up doing. Paul is saying it as a Christian. So you don't have to beat yourself up if it's not all hitting on all the cylinders. Like, no, I, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm also not where I was. I'm doing way better than I used to be, and I'm going to keep, keep chugging along with this thing of how God wants to transform me into his image. So he said, I discover that even when I want to do good, evil is ready to sabotage me. Do you believe that? True today? All the way back to Genesis, it says sin is crouching at the door and it desires to have you. But if your immune system is strong enough, it can't have you, right? It could crouch there all day long if it wants to. But if, but if I'm built up in the power of the Lord, it has no impact on me. I've been vaccinated by Jesus, right? That thing can't affect my system. But if there's open doors to sin, that gives them an entry. And the snake, it's like a snake, right, slithering in. So you're not supposed to live in a legalistic thing. Well, I better not do this, and I better not do that, and I better not wear makeup, and I better not do all these things that happen with legalism. It's not what I better do is soak myself in the Word of God and ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit to show me how to apply it in my life and how to apply it even in my own temperament. Because I'm looking around the room, there's a lot of different people here that are beautiful, wonderful people, but we're all very different. So what Heidi Baker does in Mozambique might not be what I do in the U.S. <laughs> different set of gifts. Yeah. I love her. I think she's amazing. What Chuck Pierce does, I have no idea how he does it. I'm not him. I don't have to feel less than if I'm not him. He writes a book a week. <laughs> no, kidding, but it feels like that. I haven't written one. I'm writing a chapter in a book, and I'm, like, laboring over the thing. So I, God's saying, that's not a problem. I didn't make you him. You could aspire to be prophetic because that's, that's what he is. You could, what Heidi Baker does is see signs, wonders, and miracles and evangelize. You can aspire towards that goal, but you don't have to be her. You're not less than because you don't lead worship like Chris Tomlin. How many people lead like that guy? So shouldn't do it? No. You'll have to put up with me in the meantime. <laughs> I discovered that, I said it before, I'm going to read it one more time, that when I want to do good, evil is ready to sabotage me. It didn't yet. Deep within my true identity, I love to do what pleases the Lord, but I also discern another power, Paul is saying, operating in my humanity, waging a war against the moral principles of my conscience. Boy, that's a powerful little phrase right there. So when people say, well, why do we have to talk so much about warfare? And why do people pray so loud at this church? And you sing about it, and we're making declarations and decrees. There you go. There's another power operating in my humanity that's waging a war against my moral conscience in the word. It's constantly testing me and trying me to see if I'll fall. He roams about. That's what the Bible says about the devil. Like a lion. Seeking whom, what? He may devour. Well, make yourself undevourable. <laughs> Boy, that's a mouthpiece. Mouthful. Uh, fully possible. I mean, there are people, you know, that you can look back in church history, just model Christian people who were, walked through amazing temptations and trials and still kept the faith, right? Like, so I'm not saying we, we honor man, but just recognize that he gave you the tools to resist sin. Um, I was in New York City um, a couple of weeks ago. I'm involved with this group over there, strong Christian group. And the founder, a uh, very wealthy investment guy, strong Christian, started a foundation. And, and all they really do is encourage people to read scripture together out loud. <laughs> like that doesn't sound very hard, does it? But people, you know, what he said when he gave his testimony of why the Lord so convicted him about this is that many of the churches that he visited, because he travels all over the world, they were just telling their own stories. They weren't reading the Bible, right? Like, like it's become too user-friendly. It's become too seeker-sensitive. Nobody's talking about sin anymore. Well, what good is the blood if it's not going to cover your sin? What were you saved from? Sin. If you're in the camp now, if you're a Christian, sin is not okay, so we better be aware and alert that when it's trying to creep in, it's very subtle, right? The devil's the father of lies. So he's constantly trying to lie to you and get you to cross those boundaries. And, and the Lord's, nope, 
You have a new power in operation in you now, not the old one. I love this. Even though there is another power, verse 23, it's operating in my flesh, in my humanity, and it's waging a war against me, but it's not going to bring me into captivity as a prisoner. It's an unwelcome intruder. Amen? So I'm ending early today. You could, you could write this date down. Let's stand. Do we have prayer ministry today? Oh, look at that. I forgot to do the offering. I was wondering why I was getting glares from the, uh, from the board members. <laughs> I could tell, Ron, something was up wherever you are. Yeah, boy, I was so focused on the meal, I forgot to... Uh, Talk about an important thing. But I did encourage you to put towards the war chest, didn't I? Wait. Oh, pray over the offering. God, what's wrong with me? Here's what Trisha did. I thought we took it. Take another offering. I think that's what the Lord's saying. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Really, I'm just kidding. I do have a brain. It's just not working right right now. No, this, I just want to read one more scripture together. And why I want to stand is because, you know, one of the things that I think is a sin in, in, in that is unbelief is that we don't really see God for who he is. We think he's angry at us, you know, and he could have called himself a lot of names, but he didn't call himself omnipotent one. He called himself father, Right? It's really intimate. It says we get filled with the Spirit, Abba. We cry, Abba, Father. What is that about? It's like recognizing that he loves you. But you might not have had such a great father. I think I told you about the, the documentary that we watch about the Christian singer named Russ Taff, right? Like this guy had a really horribly abusive life. And his, it was his dad who was also a, a preacher who had his own problems, but like it was so hard for him to stop drinking because the pain was so high. But when he got a father's blessing, that's the thing that broke the dam in his life. He got a father's blessing from a, a godly man that gave him something he never had. And that's really where I want to close today is because if there are little foxes trying to attack you, trying to spoil the vine, we saw it. They're, they're going to try, but they don't have to have any effect on you. Okay, they don't have to impact you because there's a new power in operation. There's the Holy Spirit resurrected in you. We're not bound by the law anymore. We're bound by the Holy Spirit with the law. Big difference, isn't it? It doesn't just convict us of what we're doing wrong. It shows us there's another way to live. So it's a really simple verse, and I think you know it from Luke 11, verse 13. Is it up there? Good. Okay, it says, well, let's read it out loud together, okay? If imperfect parents know how to lovingly take care of their own children and give them what they need, how much more will the perfect Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit's fullness when His children ask Him? That's really important, isn't it? How many of you have been asking Him lately? Let's make it more hands going up right now. Can we just ask Him right now? I know, I, I know now that you love me as a dad. You're not angry. You're not ready to punish me. You love me as a dad. You want what's good for me to come to pass. Block out the memories. Any way that I connected my earthly father to the image of you, block it out right now because that's not what you want. You want me to understand you as a loving heavenly father who cares about me and wants what's best for me. Bless you. If you had a great father, I, I just really honor you in that. Many people did it and it's hindering their prayers, amen? So Lord, I just ask that as we have our hands lifted up right now, any way that we don't have the right image of you, any way when there's unbelief in our heart about who you are, would you just cleanse that out of us right now? Lord, right now we're asking you, Holy Spirit, we're asking you to, to hit the reset button and flush that old counterfeit picture of who the Father is and show us right now the real picture of who you are, Lord. Why wouldn't he do that? Of course, he wants us to know who he really is. Satan wants to lie to you and tell you that he's always mad, that God is always angry at you all the time. But just say, I receive the proper image of a heavenly father who is my Abba Father. I receive the spirit of adoption 
which cries, Abba, Father, you are my daddy, and I love you. Help me know how much you love me. And Lord, I just pray now for the congregation, anyone else who's watching, that we would leave this place today more fully girded with the armor that you have given us, more fully prepared to know that we have tools to fight when the temptations come. We do not have to fall victim to those temptations that are coming at us. We have had a shift in our thinking about who you are and how much you love us and that you really are for us, not against us, not ready to punish us when we make a mistake, and that you've given us weapons in this warfare to fight against the temptations that come. We want to live before you, Lord, as hungry people that are seeking more of your presence in our lives, that are demonstrating more of your power every day as we walk this walk out with you. Give us a sense of urgency to know you've got a great mission and a great plan for our lives and help us tap into that power source that you've given us in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. And we do have a prayer ministry team today, yes? Okay, I got one thing, right? So if you need prayer, you can come right up this side aisle here and... Um, I, I just bless you. We're, we're not going to pray for the offering. That's it. Uh, we'll pray after that's over. I'm sorry. I missed that opportunity. Um, you all have an awesome day. And uh, see you when we get back together. <laughs>